Hello, everybody. Welcome to our business webinar, Marking Clean Air Day 2021. My name is Desiree Abrahams, and I'm the Senior Business Engagement Manager at Global Action Plan. Global Action Plan is an environmental charity based in the UK, and we work on two main issues, post-consumerism and clean air. We're the founders of the Clean Air Day, the UK's biggest awareness raising campaign on air pollution, and today we're marking our fifth anniversary. So we champion clean air in many ways, and we work with very different stakeholders to elevate the issue, including children, teachers, hospitals, local governments, local communities, and more recently, business. So in 2019, we established the Business Clean Air Task Force. This small group brings together a small group of companies that see air quality as a strategic sustainability issue. A year later, we established Business for Clean Air, which are a set of nine principles open to all companies, irrespective of sector or size. It provides a business framework for those companies that are keen to take action on air pollution. And just two days ago, we launched our white paper, Air Pollution, The Next Business Challenge, which has three main purposes. Firstly, it's a business call to action. We want to see business taking action on air pollution. Secondly, it offers recommendations specifically to 19 industry sectors and some general guidance for companies. And thirdly, it fleshes out the new business responsibility, the corporate responsibility to respect a child's right to a healthy environment, which is the subject of this webinar today. So as of October 2020, companies globally have a responsibility to respect a child's right to a safe, clean and healthy environment following the passing of Resolution 4530 at the Human Rights Council. And critically, Resolution 4530 mirrors the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, another human rights resolution that was passed 10 years ago. Resolution 4530 reaffirms the separate duties and responsibilities for governments and companies. And specifically, it, it calls on governments to act on their duty to protect a child's right to a healthy environment. And it calls on companies to take responsibility to respect them. Now, this is important because we have just celebrated 10 years of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights just yesterday. And as we've been reflecting on how companies have embraced these principles, we hope that businesses will similarly rise to the challenge and embrace Resolution 4530. So shortly, I'll be introducing you to our keynote speaker, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, Dr. David Boyd who's been instrumental on shining the light on this issue and helping to bring resolution 4530 to fruition. However, before I hand over to the UN Special Rapporteur, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping points and structure for our session today. So firstly, we'd very much love your questions. So if you have any questions for our speakers, including the UN Special Rapporteur, please do use the dedicated Q&A function. Secondly, for those of you that wish to comment during the session, please could you use the dedicated chat function. And on to our structure. So at first we're going to hear from the UN Special Rapporteur. And following the Q&A session with him, we'll hear from our civil society and company representatives. And this session will be moderated by my colleague Larissa Lockwood. So without much further ado, I'm delighted to introduce you to the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, speaking to us live from Canada very early in the morning, Dr. David Boyd. David, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Desiree. And it's a delight uh, for me to be joining you from the West Coast of Canada today. Canada today. I'm just gonna press the buttons here so I can share my screen. And there we go. 
Um, I've been serving in this UN position for three years, and uh, in March, the Human Rights Council just renewed my mandate for another three years. Um, today, we're going to talk about air pollution, which is a topic that's uh, really critically important. And so thank you for your work, Desiree, and shining a light on this issue. Air pollution inflicts more pain, suffering, disease, and death on humans than any other environmental risk in the world today. Um, here's... And, and, and it's really actually quite astonishing. According to the World Health Organization, air pollution causes more than 7 million premature deaths every year, a figure which includes more than 600,000 children under the age of five. So in other words, air pollution is responsible for more deaths every year than war, murder, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, AIDS combined. Um, air pollution every year, every year is causing more deaths than the COVID-19 pandemic has combined. And this is really the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of impacts on human rights because air pollution harms the health of hundreds of millions of people every year. Uh, according again, again to the World Health Organization, over 90% of the world's population lives in places where air quality does not meet WHO standards. So here's a, here's a map that shows the breakdown of those 7 million deaths. You can see Every, every area of the globe is affected. Uh, and here's a picture of 800 faces. That's the number of deaths every hour caused by air pollution. Or you can put it another way, every five seconds a person dies because of exposure to air pollution. Those are abstract statistics though. And I think that as human beings, what really moves us is individuals. And so here's a photograph of Ella Kissy de Bra, a beautiful young British child who died all too young because of exposure to air pollution. The first case in the world where the death of, a, of, a, of an individual was directly connected to air pollution. So really, I dedicate my work on air pollution to the memory of Ella Kissy de Bra. When we think about air pollution in places like Canada and the UK, we think of outdoor air pollution, but in fact, Air pollution is a combination of indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution. Um, household air pollution in many countries continues to be a major problem. Uh, the burning of solid fuels like wood, crop residues, coal and dung for cooking and heating within the home. Also the use of kerosene for lighting. Uh, that's a major contributor to the environmental burden of disease from air pollution. And then of course, outdoor air pollution is caused primarily by electricity generation, um, industry, agriculture, transportation, uh, and poor waste management. So here's a picture of two lungs, uh, a moderately healthy lung on the left that's been exposed to uh, moderate levels of air pollution and the lung on the right, which belongs to an individual who has been exposed to high levels of air pollution. So the science is absolutely crystal clear that exposure to air pollution causes respiratory illness um, and exacerbates conditions such as asthma air pollution can also cause lung cancer. But many people don't realize that the, the biggest impact of air pollution on people's health is on heart disease and stroke. Um, this, is, this is the single biggest uh, element of the mortality and the morbidity, morbidity that I was referring to earlier. There's also emerging science, which is not as clearly established, that air pollution impacts, uh, causes preterm births and low birth weights. Uh, that it causes impaired neurological development in childhood, and that it may contribute to uh, ongoing neurological disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Another really critical fact about air pollution is that it's not equitably or fairly distributed. Uh, among the mo people most severely harmed by air pollution are women, children, older persons, uh, minorities, people living in poverty, and people with pre-existing health conditions, and people who fall into several of those categories. Of course, in states where household or indoor air pollution is a major problem, it's women who suffer the highest levels of exposure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this is just a map showing the distribution of premature mortality caused by the main pollutant that causes premature deaths, which is fine particulate matter. You can see uh, China and India, partly because they're largest large populations, but also because of high levels of air pollution, both of those countries with over a million premature deaths every year.
The World Bank has estimated that the global costs of air pollution exceed $5 trillion per year, an almost unfathomable figure. And so in light of this compelling evidence, there is no doubt that poor air quality is a threat to human rights, including the rights to life, the right to health, uh, and the rights of the child. Air pollution also violates the right to a healthy environment, which is a right not yet recognized by the UK. As my colleague, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights has said, there can be no doubt that all human beings are entitled to breathe clean air. And so a lot of my work as Special Rapporteur is trying to convince countries around the world to recognize the right to a healthy environment, and then more importantly, to implement this fundamental human right. In addition to clean air, it includes, it includes clean water, healthy food, non-toxic environments where people can live, work, study, and play, healthy biodiversity and ecosystems, and a safe climate. And here's a map of the world showing that uh, the majority of countries do recognize the right to a healthy environment, either through their constitutions, through laws, or through regional treaties. Uh, but there are some big gaps on the map, Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, and the United Kingdom. My predecessor as Special Rapporteur put together a document called the Framework Principles on Human Rights and the Environment, which clarifies the obligations uh, of states as they relate to um, human rights and the environment. And those are really three main categories of procedural obligations, substantive obligations, and special obligations towards those in vulnerable situations. And of course, as we're talking about today, businesses also have responsibilities. Um, and this is a really critical part of the puzzle because businesses are responsible for a large share of air pollution, either directly through their um, activities, such as producing electricity and generating greenhouse gas emissions and other air pollutants, or indirectly through their products, such as selling motor vehicles. Um, so, I've tackled air pollution in my very first report to the Human Rights Council back in 2019 because just because this is an issue that the Human Rights Council had never had put squarely before it and because of the magnitude of impacts on human life and human health. And my report came out with seven basic steps that all countries need to take to address the problem of air pollution. Um, first of all, states have to monitor air quality and you can see from this map there are regions of the world that lack air, basic air quality monitors. Secondly, states need to identify what are the main sources of air pollution. Um, that's obviously essential in terms of creating priorities for action, and it will vary from country to country. Third, states must provide the public with information about their rights and about the um, impacts of air pollution on their health. Uh, that enables public participation in decisions that can affect air quality and it ensures that people have access to remedies in cases where their rights are being violated or threatened. The fourth step is that states have to enact legislation, regulations and standards to create enforceable limits on air pollution. And it's really remarkable that there's such wide variability uh, among states in terms of their air quality standards, including over 60 states that have no air quality standards at all. Um, the fifth step is to develop a national clean air strategy, which is a plan that with timelines and targets and measures to be taken to improve air quality. Um, and then the sixth step is to implement and enforce the clean air plan. Um, and seventh, to ensure that there are adequate resources for that implementation and enforcement and an evaluation process to make sure that if progress is not satisf satisfactory, then the plan can be strengthened and additional resources allocated. Uh, the, the great thing about air pollution, frankly, is that it's a preventable problem. So we know that air pollution has solutions. Um, and for example, there are countries around the world like France that have passed laws specifically recognizing their citizens' right to breathe clean air. Two of the, uh, initiatives globally that have resulted in incredible improvements in air quality were the phasing out of leaded gasoline and dramatic reductions in the sulfur content of uh, transportation fuels, both gasoline and diesel. Uh, these actions have produced health, environmental and economic benefits, again, valued by economists in the trillions of dollars. Uh, in terms of indoor pollution, countries like India and Indonesia have really made progress by creating um, government programs that give away free clean cook stoves uh, and subsidizing fuel. So over 100 million low income households in India and Indonesia are no longer breathing polluted air. 
Um, and countries like the United States and the United Kingdom have passed laws that uh, deal with clean air. Of course, the UK was actually the first country to pass a law governing air pollution back in the late 1950s. Um, in the United States, they have found that they're very, the strong regulations under the Clean Air Act have enabled the American economy to grow by over 260% over the last 30 years, while emissions of the six major pollutants fell by 60%. In China, which 10 years ago had a severe air pollution problem, they have take, taken strong measures and they've reduced some of the major pollutants by 30 and 40%. Um, um, many activities that harm air quality are also major contributors to climate change. And so it's really encouraging to see states like the UK and Canada phasing out the use of coal-fired electricity generation. And when it comes to uh, young people, young people, as, as we saw prior to the pandemic, millions of young people in the streets calling for action on climate change, calling for action on air pollution. Our failure to respect the rights of children is harming their health, impairing their future, uh, impairing their futures. Um, some, of these, some of these impacts of air pollution on young people have lifelong impact. And so it's really critical for businesses to be part of the solution. Um, you know, as I mentioned, cleaner electricity generation, we need a shift away from you know, in the United Kingdom, diesel vehicles are a major source of air pollution. We need to shift away from that. The city of London has taken some steps with its, um, with its rules governing vehicles in the center and with its levies on uh, different types of vehicles, but more needs to be done. The solutions are there. Um, other countries, Stockholm, for example, is a city where 90% of all commuting trips in Stockholm either inv involve walking, cycling, or public transit. Um, so these are some of the solutions that exist. And by investing in these solutions, we're actually not only protecting human rights, we're also producing better economic and environmental outcomes for everyone. I believe that everyone on this planet has the right to breathe clean air. And so I hope that you can all be part of that, both in the UK and globally. Thank you very much and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, David. Um, that was excellent. Um, a really great overview, especially of what states um, should be doing to assume and assert their duty to protect human rights. Um, David, we have a couple of questions. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll read it out now. Thank you. David, today on Clean Air Day in the UK, we have seen good business engagement on air pollution, but few companies addressing pollution coming from their core business functions. Can you share any good examples of business practice on air pollution from other countries that might help inspire change here? Yeah, great question. So um, it's interesting in my in my role so far as Special Rapporteur, I have focused primarily on good practices by states in this field. And so um, I've actually I'm planning to do a special report on uh, the role of businesses in, in in the field of environment and human rights in, in the next year or so. Um, in terms of good practices, well, I mean, I think that uh, one example of a good practice that's really important is uh, in the motor vehicle sector, where you have companies like Tesla that are producing fully electric vehicles. And frankly, those vehicles, if, they're, if their electricity is being generated from renewable sources, those are pollution-free vehicles. So um, the, the other motor vehicle manufacturers are starting to produce models that are electric, um, but we really need to rapidly shift away from the internal combustion engine because it's a, a driving force, not only of poor air quality throughout the UK, Europe and the world, but also a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So, so motor vehicle companies shifting away, um, utility companies shifting away from coal. And I would say that, you know, the UK has made great progress in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving air quality by phasing out coal. But that shift to natural gas now needs to take the next step because natural gas still is a polluting form of electricity generation. We need to go all the way to renewables. And um, so that's, I, that's a really a point that I think is worth uh, uh, mentioning is that these transitions that are underway are going to have winners and losers in terms of the business community. But the economic opportunities in the shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy in the shift from towards energy storage, which were energy storage is a critical part of the solution for renewable energy systems. 
Um, the shift from a, a linear economy where, where we um, extract resources, make things and throw away the waste to a circular economy, all of these profound societal transformations come with multi-trillion dollar economic opportunities for businesses. So, you know, for example, um, alternatives to single use plastics that are uh, fully recyclable, uh, that are reusable, that are repairable, all of these are great opportunities for businesses. Great, thank you. And we have another one that's just come in. Um, so David, how important do you feel that air quality monitoring is in tackling local air pollution? Yeah, air quality monitoring is absolutely essential. And um, so, you know, it, it started off, I showed that map that shows there's quite a few air quality monitors in places like Europe, and there are quite a few air quality monitors throughout the UK. But it's really important to make sure that the distribution of air quality monitors uh, includes less well off uh, or socially or economically marginalized communities. So, you know, if we go back to the situation that that faced Ella Kissy de Bra, she lived in London, England. I mean, people think of London, England as one of the wealthiest places in the world, like this leading cosmopolitan city. But there are areas of London, as her death illustrated so painfully, that have very poor air quality. So it's important to have a, a, a really good distribution of air quality monitors. And there's really some interesting technological breakthroughs. It used to be that air quality monitors would cost around 200,000 British pounds per unit, but there are now air quality monitors available that are reliable and cost a fraction of that. Great, thank you. And this will be our last question for now. David, why do you think the UK government has yet to recognize the right to a healthy environment? Oh, such a vexing question. Uh, you know, the UK government takes a very narrow view of human rights generally. They, 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 they focus on the, the kind of civil and political rights, and they're not very friendly towards the economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. And so, for example, uh, in 2010, when there was a United Nations resolutions on the rights to water and sanitation, it took a real sustained effort from civil society to persuade the United Kingdom to go along with those resolutions. And I think we're starting to see that now where civil society is pressing the UK government to go along with uh, accepting UN resolutions, recognizing the right to a healthy environment. You know, the United, the United Kingdom is hosting the 26th Conference of the Parties to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change later this year in Glasgow. It'll be a bit of a black eye for the British if there's at the same time a UN resolution on the right to a healthy environment and the UK is frankly one of the few outliers that doesn't go along with those resolutions. Super. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I should say I'm Larissa, the Director of Clean Air at Global Action Plan. Um, it's fantastic to get the international perspective because, of course, air moves. This is an international problem. And, of course, a lot of what our behaviours in the UK, you know, the products we buy and so on, are being manufactured in factories that are causing pollution elsewhere. So we definitely all have a role to play in the international field as well as tackling air pollution in the UK. And very timely that you mentioned the Ellicacy Deborah case, because of course today, um, I don't think it's any coincidence that on Clean Air Day, government and health bodies were required to respond to the coroner's report to say how, what action they will take in response to his recommendations to make sure that no more children um, essentially die from air pollution in the UK. And of course, you know, those responses are from the health sector, they're from the public sector, but uh, we also know that businesses will have been contributing to that air pollution um, that uh, caused the death of that girl and will be harming uh, the health of so many uh, millions of children across the UK. So thank you very much for, for setting that scene. Do stay with us um, if you can, but I'm now going to move us on to our next group of speakers who are each going to be uh, talking for 10 minutes and then we will have a discussion at the end. Um, so do post your questions as we're going along and Desiree will harvest them and feed them back to me to, to feed to the speakers at the end. So uh, we're going to go in this order. So I'm really, really delighted to be joined by this panel today. Um, it being Clean Air Day, we have seen tremendous um, business activity on um, air pollution today. But um, a lot of it is, is um, sort of uh, 
one of the questions alluded to has been more on the staff engagement side of things, how staff are coming to and from the workplace rather than really addressing some of the uh, fundamental emissions that, that businesses um, are contributing. So I'm looking forward to getting stuck into to that discussion and delighted to be joined by Maria Pia Bianchetti, the Private Sector Policy and Influencing Manager at the UK Committee for UNICEF, followed by Jamie Quinn, Director of Responsible Business and Safety, Health, Environment and Quality at NG UK and Ireland, Martin Fahi, the Head of Sustainability at Mitsubishi Electric UK and Ireland, and John Morrison, who's the Executive Director at the Institute for Human Rights and Business. Uh, you've each got 10 minutes. I guess I'll start waving madly um, or messaging you. And if that fails, I'll just jump in and <laughs> interrupt rudely because I'm keen that we make sure we have time for discussion at the end. Um, but with no further ado, Maria, Pierre, over to you. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thanks for Global Action Plan for hosting this important webinar on Cleaner Day. Uh, on Cleaner Day. Um, as we all know, um, this year theme for Cleaner Day is to protect children's health. And for us at the UK Committee for UNICEF, this is an incredibly um, important topic to our mission and to our work. And as a bit of an introduction of what UNICEF is and does, UNICEF works in, under, in over 190 countries uh, and territories across the world, um, providing support in emergencies and technical advice to governments. And all of our work is underpinned by the United Nations Convention on the, the Rights of the Child. And particularly today and for this webinar is of special importance Article 24 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the article that provides for the right of every child to grow up in a safe and clean environment. Um, and this specifically has underpinned all of our work to date to protect children's health from the, the harmful effects of air pollution and specifically of particulate matter 2.5. Around three years ago, uh, we launched um, a campaign tox called Toxic Air Campaign, which was informed by three reports. Um, and the flagship report was called Healthy Air for Every Child. Um, and uh, um, it was published in 2019. And the report found out that in England alone, over 4 million children are growing up in uh, areas with unsafe levels of air pollution. And why this is a problem for children, um, David uh, gave a very good introduction on the artful impacts of air pollution on human um, and uh, on human rights. And the most artful type of air pollution for children is particulate matter. These are toxic emissions that are in the air and they can have a, a long lasting um, health problems effect for children. So including stunted lung growth and uh, an increased risk of asthma and pneumonia. And the fact is that the impacts uh, on the health of children is not only on their health in the present, but actually those impacts translate into their adulthood. Um, and that affect, affect essentially their development opportunities later in life. In fact, long-term exposure to um, uh, these toxic emissions could leave children at risk of suffering from lung cancer and cardiovascular disease later when they become uh, um, adults. And so as you can see, um, children are uh, disproportionately affected by air pollution, and yet they are the ones who least contribute to air pollution. Um, and uh, this is why UNICEF UK has been, uh, um, has been uh, working on this uh, topic. And we know that the government, the UK government has, has published the Clean Air Strategy, making a commitment to halving the number of people in the UK in, who live in areas where air pollution exceeds WHO um, targets, which shows there's a welcome step and it shows that there is, there is a commitment to tackle air pollution. Um, and for UNICEF UK, it is critical for us that the UK government set legally binding targets to meet the WHO recommendation limit values for particulate matter across the UK. Um, this is, was one of the fundamental, it is one of the fundamental recommendations that um, the campaign on toxic air has. And in fact, um, we have been supporting partners 
and other organizations within the sector to table an amendment to the Environment Bill, which is currently progressing in Parliament. The Environment Bill contains clauses to set targets related to air quality and a specific target uh, when it comes to, um, to tackle particulate matter 2.5. However, those limit values for these targets are not contained in the bill itself. And that's what we want to see, legally binding um, targets in the law. Um, and now that the UK has left the EU, we see a real opportunity to affect a positive and world leading change to effectively uh, tackle air pollution, um, which is why we continue to um, support this area of work and to, uh, to um, strongly advocate for protection in the law for the health of children. Um, UNICEF UK, um, I'd say, as part of its role in advocating the realization of rights um, of every child around the world, also looks at the role of businesses in ensuring that they respect child rights and that they can support um, child rights. And so we know that uh, the responsibility of tackling air pollution does not only sit with the government, but also businesses have a real important role to play um, in this. Um, and we know that the way that companies have an impact on the environment will also have an impact on the rights of children. So, for example, um, if we think about uh, how um, the mining project can have environmental impacts, localized environmental impacts in terms of creating dust, erosion, soil, water, um, and their um, contamination, we know that this can lead to respiratory, skin, and eye diseases for children. And we know that children are particularly um, vulnerable to these. Um, to these um, effects because they are more likely to spend time outside um, in the outdoor area uh, by playing outside. Um, and we know that their hand to mouth behavior means that they're more likely to um, ingest harmful um, materials. And so we know that they have, uh, um, you know, these impacts have a disproportionate impact on uh, the rights of children. Um, and in fact, a number of you know, international documents and UN resolution, as you mentioned, recognize the responsibility of businesses in addressing uh, um, uh, environmental impacts and the rights of children. Uh, and they have a set of recommendations for action. Um, and so for states, for example, is to regulate businesses and require that businesses conduct child rights due diligence which is a human rights due diligence that integrates also the um, child rights considerations. And for businesses, it's also to conduct human rights due diligence that considers um, child rights as well as part of the whole uh, process and to prevent and to mitigate the harmful effects on children that comes from their negative impact um, on the environment. Um, I think it's worth noting um, today in this webinar, um, also um, it's worth noting that the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, last week just announced that it's going to write a general comment on the rights of the child and the environment with a specific focus on the climate change. Um, and a general comment is the authoritative interpretation by, by the committee on how the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child should be implemented in practice with particular topics. And I'm sure that this will be um, incredibly helpful in uh, progressing further the, um, the, um, the, the topic and making further um, progress. Um, and I mentioned human rights due diligence. And human rights due diligence is a topic that is not, it is something that is not new as a concept. But I think it is particularly important, as Desiree mentioned, that in this week we are also celebrating the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And we know that um, human rights due diligence is one effective way for businesses to prevent, mitigate, and remediate negative impacts on human rights. And we must remember that children's rights are human rights, so it should be part of that due diligence process. Um, we're also now seeing a wave of legislation around the world that um, incorporates a requirement for businesses to um, conduct human rights and environmental due diligence. 
Uh, and here in the UK, we are supportive of the court from civil society to introduce similar legislation for businesses in the UK um, as well. Um, in fact, last year we published a report called uh, Preventing Corporate Abuse and Realizing Child Rights that specifically um, uh, outlined why this type of legislation is needed in the UK and why it must also include um, child rights. Um, we know that a number of businesses are taking voluntary action to address their negative impacts and to respect human rights and child rights. However, for the scale and speed of change that we need to see to actually make um, effectively respect for child rights uh, a reality, we believe that government action through law is the one that is required because we need a system that creates incentives and rewards for those businesses who actually uphold the responsibility to respect children's rights and the scales up action at a speed that will motivate those who instead are not taking enough of a stronger action. And for doing this, um, we need to make sure that any legislation is holistic and comprehensive, uh, that looks at um, uh, children's rights holistically, at human rights and children's rights holistically, and requires businesses to specifically take into account how they affect different groups of particular risk of vulnerability and marginalization, such as children. Um, and I'll just conclude here. Um, I think, you know, by acknowledging the rights of children and linking together the environmental and the social aspect um, of the diligence, the UK government, the businesses as well, can uh, um, together take an affirmative action to fully realize uh, children's rights and ensure that uh, children's health is protected from the harmful um, effects of air pollution. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Maria Pierre. And you make the case very eloquently about why we need to protect children's health in particular, how very vulnerable they are. And interesting, your figure, um, 29 figure of, of 4 million children growing up in areas of high air pollution. So today we put out some stats on the number of children being educated in areas um, with dangerously high levels of air pollution over WHO standards and that's about three million children in the UK being educated in, in those areas so uh, obviously far too many um, so thank you very much for, for that um, hard-hitting case as to why we need to act um, on children's rights as part of human rights. Thank you so much. Um, great, now we're gonna move on to Jamie Quinn um, from NG to tell us about um, what your company is up to to tackle air pollution. Jamie, thank over you. to you. Brill, thank you. Thank you, Narissa. Just checking you can hear me all right. Yep, perfect. Grand, okay. Um, so I guess first off, you know, thanks very much for the invite um, to speak today. A bit of a shout out really, you know, I think every year, uh, Clean Air Day, uh, it's a fantastic event, uh, you know, and, and gains so much traction from all different sectors and, and walks of life across the UK. So once again, uh, I've just seen the, the media coverage, actually, that's, that's been shared this this year, and it's absolutely fantastic. So uh, well done to Global Action Plan, and thank you for the invite today. Um, so I think uh, uh, really, you know, I wanted to talk through uh, from a business perspective, um, what we've been doing uh, with regard to, to clean air. I've got uh, two or three slides, that's all. Uh, and I've just looked at the clock, so I'll try, uh, Larissa, to, to stick to time where I can. Now, I was going to give a bit of um, a few facts around the impact of, of air quality on, on health, but I think that uh, given um, what we've heard um, already from David, I'm not going to uh, try and replicate um, the... the, the um, uh, facts that have been shared, but rather perhaps move straight on to the role that, that, that business has to play in addressing this, this global and local issue with regard to uh, air quality. I'll try and take you through some practical examples um, from within the organisation, um, some that are specific to our core deliverables as a business, but others that can be adopted uh, indeed by all, all businesses, uh, no matter what sectors that you work in. Um, I, I, I also think um, uh, it's worth re-emphasising the point around the immediate orientation when people hear about clean air to go to outdoor 
um, uh, air quality. And I think that, you know, what we've seen over the last few years is a growing appreciation of uh, the importance of indoor air quality as well. So this kind of um, acknowledgement um, that we spend most of our time indoors, um, you know, we, we are potentially exposed to, uh, you know, chemicals from the, 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 the products that are, that are indoors, um, from the gases, uh, the vapours, uh, and indeed through uh, the air that's pumped inside uh, through a lot of the mechanical ventilation as well. So I think um, certainly from a business perspective and, and, and a general health issue, um, an awareness of indoor air quality is really important. And I guess to layer on top of that, we've seen that even more emphasised with the COVID pandemic and, and, and the um, how essential it is to ventilate uh, indoors, um, both um, uh, naturally and, and again through, through mechanical ventilation to avoid this kind of transmission risk around airborne uh, aerosols of COVID. So kind of trying to link the, 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 the two together there. Um, I think from a, from a business perspective, um, we recognised a number of years ago, like any, any big thorny issue, um, it can't be solved in isolation. So we, 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 we very much look to partner. Um, uh, we, we have done so with um, GAP for many years. Um, and I'll, I'll pick up on some of the activities around that shortly, but also academic institutes, uh, King's College, uh, London, and also the um, Sustainability Supply Chain School. So again, picking up the role that our suppliers can have in, in helping us to collectively achieve some of these, these aims. And what we did was we built it into uh, an overall strategy for the organisation and I guess today's conversation is very much focused on supporting our communities uh, and, and the environment. So maybe we'll sort of skip on to, to the next slide now, if, 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 if we may. Um, I'm ju just trying to sort of um, focus in on a few things here that we, we've been, been looking at. So um, I was trying to remember actually, Larissa, whether it was 2018 or, or, or 19 or maybe even before, but we, we had some conversations with Global Action Plan around kind of um, trying to address the issue of um, a huge demand for um, commercial vans and a limited supply and how perhaps uh, if a collective intent could be expressed to government and manufacturers, it would really um, help to mobilise. Now, um, where we are now, this conversation is uh, commonplace and it's discussed a lot, but actually if you go back three or four years, it really wasn't in, in, this, in this position. So I think we took the, the view that it was, it was necessary. And um, as a part of that scheme and others, um, you know, some uh, significant organisations have signed up to support um, both from the corporate world and also from, from, from local authorities. And I think you know, that will continue in its next guise uh, as well. Um, we've also been keen to um, support through the Business Clean Air Task Force. So uh, you know, getting together with other like-minded organizations that really wanted to uh, work collectively, uh, collaboratively around moving the agenda on. Um, moving on to the, the next piece around our um, uh, targets as a business, we wanted uh, this not to be uh, in any way, shape or form uh, nice corporate rhetoric, but actually to back it up with uh, action and investment. So um, actually back in 2018, we made a commitment around getting 20% of our fleet onto EV and zero diesel by 2025. Uh, a lot of other organisations are, are now, I'm, I'm very happy to say, um, committed along the same path. Um, uh, and we are continuing to ramp up the ambition uh, around that as well. And what does that look like? Well, uh, to give you a flavour, we've had over 500 vehicles that were either diesel or petrol that are now pure EV. Uh, and we've invested over six hundred thousand uh, pounds on uh, infrastructure, charging infrastructure. Um, so we provide home charging for free for our employees to try and get them uh, to come on that journey. Uh, excuse the pun uh, with us. Um, 
Um, we've also, as an organisation, invested heavily in the public and private networks, so rapid chargers, uh, over 425 rapid chargers across the UK, over a thousand fast EV chargers as well. So um, somebody mentioned earlier on around this being core to an organisation's deliverables, and hopefully that gives an example of uh, what we're trying to do uh, um, in, in, in the business as well. I think we um, have looked at the partnership and, and spoken about that already, um, maybe on the, 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 the tree fund as well. So uh, this again was created in 2019 um, and it, it was created to tackle a couple of issues for us. So firstly, the piece around um, investing in uh, habitat, biodiversity, the environmental benefits, including air quality uh, around that. Um, but also as a way of engaging with our employees and also our clients uh, on, on the campaign. So we planted, you know, thousands of trees across the UK. Uh, it was um, inhibited a bit last year because of, of, of COVID, but still very much uh, committed to that uh, as an organisation. And then the final piece is around, um, you know, what we're doing on, on, on this journey around zero carbon. And maybe we'll just kind of move on to the next slide uh, at that stage, if that's okay. Um, conscious of time, Larissa, don't panic. Um, two minutes, thank you. Um, so the, the, the first bit, I've, I've shown the charter to you. So this is a commitment for the business, commitment for all employees to make objectives, really trying to get it down to throughout all levels in the, in, in, in the business. Um, we're in the final stages of finalising our uh, uh, zero carbon roadmap. And we didn't want to rush into that and, and just put out something uh, uh, in, in, in the media around our commitment, but be very, very clear and sure that we can deliver upon that roadmap. Um, we, um, as part of our business, um, we help other organisations, local authorities with their own uh, roadmap to zero carbon as well. And I've mentioned around the EV fleet. Um, our employees, you know, we can't forget about our employees. Um, I've mentioned around the goals, but we've all seen a massive uh, transition over the last 16 months or so. And, uh, you know, that's becoming sort of formalised in terms of our policy of whatever you want to call it, flexible working, home working, hy hybrid working, um, how, how we formalise that for our employees, both from a quality of life, actually, perspective, as well as air quality uh, and environmental benefits. And then we've done some other stuff, um, which has been really great around the engagement of health and wellbeing, um, various campaigns through the summer and winter periods, actually. Um, and, um, you know, we've, we've um, very much uh, supported Clean Air Day over the last number of years and continually do surveys and webinars and various pledges across the organization uh, to uh, try and embed this uh, in, in, in the business and show what we can do for our own employees and also the communities that we work in. So Larissa I'll probably uh, stop there and you never know I might be short of time. <laughs> yeah bang on thank you very much Jamie. Um, and yeah, I, I always feel mean sort of cutting everyone off. So do keep posting questions because uh, we can all we'll have a, a conversation together once everyone said their piece. Um, so yeah, Jamie, yours is, is one of the companies that's always super active on Clean Air Day and it is very inspiring, I think, for others in the business sector to see um, what you guys are up to. And really good point about addressing indoor air quality. Never has uh, ventilation been such a topic of well, I'd say dinner party conversations, but we're not having them anymore, are we? But playground conversations, <laughs> like no one's ever been interested in ventilation before, but suddenly everybody is. And there are obviously very strong links between uh, air pollution and COVID-19, because those who are suffering from health conditions that are caused or worsened by air pollution are those who have these underlying health conditions that puts them more at risk of complications and death from COVID. So yeah, definitely worth uh, looking at both of them tomorrow together. Thank you very much. We'll come back okay, um, to both you and Maria Pia in a moment. But next up, we have Martin from uh, Mitsubishi Electric, uh, who, uh, well, I know you've been looking at indoor air quality as well, Martin, but um, you also have a, a broader environmental sustainability vision. So tell us about that and, and what you're up to. Yes, well, well thank you, everyone. And um, uh, yes, you'll, you'll move my slides on as, as we talk, won't you? So thank you very much. 
so thank you to uh, David, Larissa, Desiree. Um, David and uh, Maria gave us a very clear and vivid overviews of this important area and the responsibilities we all have to play our part in maintaining and improving the air we breathe. I'm Martin Fahey, Head of Sustainability for Mitsubishi Electric, UK and Ireland, and we're a global manufacturer for many technologies, but specific to our UK and Irish activity. We are living environmental systems, which is heating, ventilating, air conditioning systems relevant to today's and wider discussion. But we're also lifts and escalators, factory automation, which is robotics and control, et cetera, power systems and automotive. That's not the uh, Mitsubishi um, cars, that's completely different to us, but we supply key components to the uh, auto industry. We were asked to look at why uh, it's vital for companies to start addressing how they positively contribute to better air pollution through their business activities and in, in order to protect children's health. Thank you. I thought I would start by highlighting our high level overarching environmental plan, which we call Environmental Vision 2050, with 2050, of course, being the net zero endpoint or prefer preferably sooner. This follows our Environmental Vision 2021 plan. You can see the uh, pattern there in which we were successful in delivering on the occasion of our 100th anniversary as a business this year. We have submitted our scope one, two, and three emissions reduction targets to uh, Science-Based Targets International for their oversight and confirmation that our plan, fully enacted of course, will mitigate, mitigate against our impacts contributing to in excess of two degrees of global temperature rise. We also work with carbon disclosure projects to offer transparency on our results and our actions. Thank you. Sustainability is not just the energy we consume or the emissions we generate, rather we, as many others, are working to help deliver on the 17 goals as defined by the UN. We have five core goals that help to form our planning, including goal three, health and well-being, which we see as our colleagues and customers using our solutions, as well as the communities that we operate in around the world. Thank you. One of our core pillars is creating a society in tune with nature. The diagram on the left helps us to understand our place and required actions in local communities and ecosystems. On the right is one of the regular audits of a factory site in Japan. This is Nagatsugawa, and I was fortunate enough to visit a few years back when we were allowed to travel to that degree. Uh, and they explain the unique ecosystem they have on site including salamanders, something we don't have in the UK. Thank you. Part of this theme of being in tune with nature is using our facilities and training our staff to deliver this message to younger generations. These are examples of our outdoor classroom concept in Japan, working in the local communities with our children from the area. There are examples of this activity from all around the world, Thailand, China, and in Europe and the Americas. However, on this next slide, closer to home, our award-winning learning curve has delivered environmental training and support to primary school children. Our next step is to look at secondary school levels, all of which is in line and supportive of their current curriculums. We have many solutions that can be applied to a building to make it more efficient and operate at lower energy levels and looking to recover heat wherever it could be deemed as a waste source, such as a byproduct of a cooling load, for example. To understand how these solutions can be applied better, we have built our own ZEB or Zero Energy Building situated at our Information Technology R&D Center in Kamakura, Japan. This allows us to look at different combinations of heat and ventilation and air conditioning, control, heat recovery, and internal and external air monitoring, so we can understand the balance between passive and mechanical and heat recovery ventilation options. As you saw from the environmental vision, we see our role as also using our footprint to get involved. Why I'm here today, why we're pleased to be part of and supporter of Clean Air Day again and everything that Global Action Plan are doing. 
this is a, an example recently from our um, hub blog site in promotion of this event. We have also worked with BESA, the Built Environment Engineering Association, in the creation of a free guide on internal air quality. That's got mentioned uh, a couple of times today and quite rightly so. Um, and we didn't want to make this um, difficult to get hold of in any way by putting behind some sort of data gathering wall. So it's completely free. Um, uh, you won't be asked for your uh, details, but if you go out and search for our digital library and then indoor air quality, you will be able to get hold of this um, free guide. As well as being a partner of the Global Action Plan, which brings us to this event today, we're also partner of the British Lung Foundation and the great work that they do in this area as well. These are some of our colleagues making their pledges for Clean Air Day. Um, thank you all for letting me take part in today. It's been a, a, a great honour to be part of it. Um, we consider um, that we have a responsibility as a business to think long term, as I think you've seen from our 2050 planning, the company and our 100 year history. The very first product we made as a business was, uh, was a desk fan. So we have been moving air around um, internally and from external to internal for a, a lot of years, and uh, we will continue to do so. I thought I would just leave you with this. Um, this image um, as we, uh, it's a small segment of the wider vision I mentioned right at the beginning, but it's showing our commitment to cultivating relevant knowledge with many colleagues so that we can amplify this message out and our actions across our sites around the world. So thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Lovely, thank you, Martin. And great to have that long-term vision, 2050 vision, but also <laughs> the short-term action that you've started on this vision you're not leaving it till uh 2049 no. before you get started no. so great and that guy very similar to today. jamie i think you know we've uh, we've been considering it long and hard so we're just at the point of making those announcements now so yeah super uh keep the questions flowing in uh while we now move over to john morrison the executive director at the institute for human rights and business who's going to reflect on two distinct yet complementary roles the state's duty to protect and the corporate responsibility to respect human rights. John, over to you. Thanks, Larissa, and congratulations to Global Action Plan for your Clean Air Day today and the media coverage you've had. I'm going to kind of do what I told you, Larissa, but I'm going to sort of weave around a bit because I don't want to repeat things that other speakers have already said. <clears throat> I'll go back to something that David said at the beginning. Um, it's a shame, I think. It's a shame when, when a special rapporteur speaks to a UK, UK audience that we haven't ratified um, the, the right to a healthy environment. So it shames me that, that our country hasn't, particularly as we'll be hosting the COP26 in Glasgow later this year, focusing on carbon in the atmosphere. But of course, as I hope to say, the issues are, are very linked. There's nothing knew about this issue of right to clean air. The Romans were moaning about it 2000 years ago. And if you look at the way that many of our cities have developed, including London, there's a reason the expensive housing is in the West End and the cheaper housing has been in the East End. And that's largely to do with prevailing wind and, and air quality um, over the past 200 years. I'm proud that we did clean it up in London with the 1956 Clean Air Act. Also, um, David, um, recognized, you know, the, the, the way we've been able to lower lead and sulfur in, 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 in emissions. But obviously there's a lot, there's a lot more that we need to do. Um, now, I would be one of the people advocating for a new Clean Air Act in this country. Um, the, the report you issued today showing that one in four school children are exposed to um, air quality standards below that acceptable to the World Health Organization is also an issue of shame. We owe it to Ella and her legacy that this country now takes clean air as serious as it did in 1956 and that we take the next step. This does mean tighter regulation. So the state duty to protect comes in when we think about transport, the energy sector, agriculture, manufacturing, and, and, and business generally to lower emissions and maybe to prohibit um, pollution in places where children 
uh, go to school and also where they, they play. So regulation, yes, state duty to protect, yes, the first thing I'll say, but, but, I'll, but I'll use my remaining minutes to talk about the corporate responsibility to respect and the things that business can do. And I think I, I want to draw parallels again to the climate sector because I, I sit on a couple of uh, advisory groups for UK ministers uh, in this country. And I've, I've just seen the sea change over the past two or three years on climate um, and how suddenly everybody's taking it very seriously indeed, um, including the UK business community. And I think the issue is not just about regulation, but it's also about access to finance has become a tipping point. Um, and the concept of stranded assets now, not just for oil, gas and mining companies, but for all business. Business knows that they can't continue uh, in business activities that are gonna be socially unacceptable in five or 10 years time because of their environmental inputs. And I think clean air sits very strongly there too. So what can we learn from the progress made on carbon for, for clean air generally? Um, how do we bring insurance companies, the private banks, the development banks, the sovereign wealth funds, the export credit agencies, and even the private equity funds, all of whom claiming they're serious about ESG these days, environment, social governance standards. It's the new sexy thing in the finance sector. How do we make clean air uh, a central part of any ESG framework? Um, and I think it can be, and I think it should be. Um, one example of this would be thinking around just transitions. It's in the preamble of the Paris Agreement. In Scotland, there's a just transition commission. And you're beginning to see uh, a recognition from the UK government too around transitional thinking. And I think we're moving beyond the, the understanding now that transition from high to low carbon or from dirty to clean air is just a scientific issue. I mean, I think the science is, is there, right? The science is there for all of us to read. And actually from our previous two, two speakers, the technology is arriving as well for how to do this. It's now become an issue actually of political will and social impact. Um, it is communities who maybe are worried about their jobs, their livelihoods, who will resist governments moving on these transitions. We need to bring all communities with us. And that's the same for the clean air scenario. It, it strikes me as strange that we have the TCFD and in the EU, the, the taxonomy, tackling some of these issues with very little focus on social risk. When social risk is actually, I think, becoming the big issue for environmental transitions. And why we continue to silo away environmental and social issues when they're so inextricably linked. And if you just talk to Ken Sarawira in Nigeria in the 1990s, when I started in business and human rights, many of these activists around the world opposing pollution in their in environments do not distinguish between the environmental social impacts of pollution, nor should we. So to finish then, to summarize, I'd like to see laws and penalties, yes, but I think access to capital is going to become a big mover and a big leverage point on, on air pollution too. Should be an issue for investors before they invest in, in, in companies. They should be asking these questions. Boards should, should look at this as an issue of corporate governance, of directed duties. You need to make sure that in the boardroom of every British company, you have someone who understands air pollution, who has visited places where Ella lived, right? And not just private schools and, and leafy suburbs, but understand how many British people live and the, and the dirty air they have to breathe. We need to see this as an issue of UK exports. It's not just good enough to run around the world signing trade agreements. This needs to be an issue of, of due diligence in relation to business activities overseas from UK companies. And I think if we begin to do all these things, and if we begin to talk about a new Clean Air Act, when the world comes to the UK, to Scotland in, in Glasgow in, in, in this November, we can hold, a, hold our heads up high and think that uh, clean air is an integral part to the, of the transitions ahead. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, John. And some excellent ideas at the end about things that we need in place, laws, penalties, access to capital, and someone responsible for air pollution at board level. Absolutely great ideas. Um, 
So let's keep this, I'm going to come to questions now. So we'll bring back all our five panelists. I think we still have David with us, which is great. I know you're coming at this from slightly different angles. So what I'm going to do is throw a few questions at you and you can sort of pick the ones <laughs> that are most relevant um, for you to respond to. So I suppose John sort of, uh, this would be a question for you, Maria, Pia and David, um, sort of picking up on, on your comment around that we've seen a sea change on, on climate um, and many businesses are involved, someone has asked, many businesses are involved with CSR initiatives or becoming a B Corps. But why do you think there's not the same enthusiasm when it comes to tackling air pollution? So hold your thoughts. I'm gonna throw a few questions in and come to you all in turn. Um, then second on that, uh, which is kind of linked, is that you know we've heard some great examples, someone has asked, so far we've heard some great examples by business speakers, but they mostly speak to employee engagement activities and partnerships with charities. How can we ensure that air pollution is an issue considered by companies more strategically within their business operations and activities? So I'm gonna uh, lump those two together for, for you three, but do come in on the next one too. Because um, Jamie and Martin, there's some which are a bit more sort of specific um, at the company level. So someone has asked, what do you think are the top three most impactful actions that businesses can take to reduce their direct and indirect air pollution? And again, that's going beyond staff engagement and communications for Clean Air Day, although we do like that too, but absolutely it has to be about um, addressing direct and indirect pollution. Um, as a secondary on that, is, is it just transport or are there other areas? Um, and sort of preempting it, I would quite like you to, to explore both areas, but when looking at um, NOx, someone has asked, uh, commented that we've obviously seen uh, recently that levels of, of traffic on the roads have re returned to the pre-pandemic levels and in some areas have increased. So what are the top things that businesses can do on that NOx point to try and reduce car use across the country? Uh, and will your companies be doing something about it? So Jamie and Martin, those are the ones for, for you to consider. And then we've got John, Maria, Pia and David on the first two. Um, so I'm going to go to the speakers in the order that we had them first. So I think we'll go to David, Maria and then John and then come back to Jamie and Martin. So David, over to you. Thanks, Larissa. I'll try and tackle the question of why we haven't addressed air pollution in the same way that we're addressing climate change. And I, I you know, it's, it's an actually an awkward answer, which is I think that the statistics are quite clear on air pollution. It is primarily harming people Globally, it's harming people in low and middle income nations within wealthy nations like Canada, where I live in the United Kingdom. It's mostly harming low income people, people of color. And so there are issues of classism and racism, which are systemic societal problems. I mean, John mentioned the way that cities are, you know, we have wealthy people living in the clean air portions of cities. That's not just happening in the UK, but around the world where um, people of low income who tend to be vulnerable and marginalized populations are. And so it's uh, it's a real challenge. And I think that uh, we need to find ways to address those systemic issues if we're going to really raise the profile of air pollution and, and solve it for everyone. Otherwise, we have a situation of basically air pollution apartheid. That's strong, but I like the way you put it. You're absolutely right. Air pollution apartheid. Let's think on that. Um, Maria, Pia, let me come to you. Sure. Um, so I think what what do we need to do to make sure that you know it becomes a core business um, issue to tackle air pollution? I think we need to be very clear that businesses should respect human rights and child rights, and they can also take additional action to support human rights and children's rights as well. And so. The, the support part is not a trade-off for respect. First of all, they need to respect human rights and child rights. And in order to do that, the very first step is to actually make sure that they identify those impacts, that they know that their core business operation, their activities, their products, where are they going to make harm or where are they going to possibly make harm? And on that basis, find a solution on how to prevent and mitigate. And there it is critical that you actually engage with those who are affected, with all those groups that must have a voice to um, be able to participate and contribute, contribute to um, the solution. And I think 
you know, I think we are slowly, um, I think we are going and transitioning towards looking more at these environmental issues and these social issues together. We're not fully there yet, but we have started. I think that would be something that will help progress in the area as well when we start looking at the topics holistically. Yes, air pollution, it is an environmental harm. However, it has a huge impact on the rights of, uh, of people. And therefore, there needs to be a holistic um, assessment, holistic action by businesses uh, as well. Super. And yeah, someone else has, has commented on, on um, how social risk is becoming the big issue, but how can we marry the environment and social so that companies are taking it, taking action on both at the same time? So it's uh, clearly something that needs to be done. I don't know if you have a quick answer to that as to how it can be done. Um, how can you marry the, um, you know, the question is that how you can marry the social risk and environmental risk. I think, you know, one way to do it is that when you look at what your, uh, your impacts are, just look at the overall picture rather than in parallel silos. I don't think the E and S in the ESG so far have been looked together. They've all been looked um, in, some, in a silo. Uh, but you know, if you look and start making questions, what does it mean to create this environmental impact for the communities where you are, then you can start merging the two um, topics. So, it is about it is about taking a more a wider look and what the issues that you are looking at and trying to consider what uh, what else it is around your environment your con your operating context that may might have a negative impact from what as a company you are doing putting in the market and etc. Great, thank you. Um, great, and John, on to you. Sure. Yeah, I agree with all that. And I, I would just add two other things, really. Um, I, for me, it's about the true social cost and the true financial cost. I think that gets us where we need to be. In terms of true social cost politically, we need a, we need a sort of David Attenborough or Greta Thunberg, I think, for this issue. Um, the Welsh government has a uh, in, um, intergenerational commissioner now. And I think in many ways, this is an issue of intergenerational justice. It's, it's justice for children, but it's justice for children yet to be born, right? Generations yet to come. And I think that there needs to be a social, the political price. We were caught up in too much political short-termism, um, as we all know. Um, let's get some long-term political thinking around, around this. And then on the business side, you know, for me, it was Nick Stern's work on climate and his development of the concept of stranded assets that began to move the financial markets nearly 10 years ago. I think we can do the same on air quality and air pollution. We can make this an issue of stranded assets so that it becomes financially punitive for business to ignore this any longer. And we can use the leverage of private and public finance to do that. So, yeah, um, it's, it's moving beyond the short term sort of mentality that, uh, that uh, dogs much of our uh, thinking at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, coming then to, to Jamie and Martin, I suppose initial reaction adds that sound to you, sort of uh, <laughs> financial penalties, punitive uh, penalties, if, if uh, you're not performing on uh, yeah. air pollution. And well, then those questions around what are the most impactful things that, that can be done um, looking at transport to reduce the cars on the road and uh, other areas of air pollution? Yeah, well, I mean, it's hard to um, argue with what John's saying. John's saying that, you know, a, a place a true cost on, on, on these things, you know, and that's a discussion around carbon as well, arguably undervalued, you know, as a commodity as well. So, uh, we can't complain at that. Um, uh, three uh, three actions. I don't suppose there's a, a, any firm right answer in this, but I mean, what I came up with um, as businesses is, um, you know, stop burning stuff. You don't have to burn something to uh, um, to create what you need now in, in buildings and the built environment. Um, then you will still need to consume energy. So consume the right energy, you know, through the right. Um, in the right way, so renewable energy. We've um, 
a, been able to do that fully uh, in the UK. We're not able to do that in some other territories just at the moment, but we're looking as to how we could achieve that. And then I think the third point for me, and, and, and you've heard from Jamie, he'll answer this him, himself, but it's like leveraging your, your footprint, you know, try and get involved, do something, um, uh, be part of the discussion, um, like, um, like events like today. Um, that sort of thing. That's the, the three I came up with. Um, car use, did you want me to touch on car use? Yeah. Yes, yeah, please. Um, we, we, like many, yeah, me, we like many, many other businesses. Obviously, we're looking at um, uh, blended, what, what, uh, what that looks like for us um, from a working point of view at the moment. Uh, I, I suppose where we are is, is if we are going to be in, let's be in for a reason, a valid reason. Let's be in and, and collaborate, for example, when we're in, um, not just be in to be at the desk by a certain time. Uh, and then hopefully that will sort that out. And I suppose my own, the other thought about there is my own car um, journey, if you want. It's hard to talk around this without puns, isn't it? But, um, you know, five years ago, I had a, a very modern diesel with heard about diesel in the UK and I was you know almost smug thinking I've got this really nice smart diesel I've now got uh, a plug-in uh, uh, electric hybrid which actually goes back next week and I think about that diesel as almost agricultural now and then in a few months uh, my fully electric vehicle arrives you know so I've been on that that five-year um, step myself as a lot of other people will be and uh, in our business as well as to how we uh, make that shift so um yeah i think blended be in for a reason and as we uh we make that transition to um, a different better type of vehicle thank you very much and jamie your thoughts top three actions and how do we get business cars off the road thanks thanks so if, if i may just quickly on the point around um you know the true true cost and value i think that what business does is it responds to uh, the economic environment and it responds to policy so if the strength is put in place around that business will react and has proven that it's very effective at doing that so in this kind of post brexit world when lots of these discussions are being had uh, potential around standards that we work to how is that reinforced through policy which again creates that environment for business to to act um, I also think there's a big piece there around um, the quantification of financial versus non-financial performance and so when we talk around you know we've got in in, in legislation uh, legislation around the social value act and actually public procurement driving a behavior around it not just being on the cheapest cost but um, social and environmental giving that more teeth uh, which again uh, will create a response from from business now i'm not this is not me saying this is all around policy and it's all around government and business has its own uh, right but I'm, I'm just making the point that um, you need to create the goalpost um, to make stuff happen um, the, the, the 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 point on the, the the kind of top three areas i think um you know martin has picked up on some of them i think the, the, the way i would probably try and pull those together is uh, one looking at travel kind of generally as an organization so it include the, the you know the transition through to vehicles which we've spoken but also uh, commuting and and this kind of uh, flexible work workforce but putting that into policy so what does that mean how, how are employees supported what does that mean around whether they're claiming expensive or, or not you start to get into a lot of the detail quite quickly actually and that's what uh, employees need support on as well as their welfare when working from home so all the focus is, you know, getting people into the offices. But what are you going to do to support people when they're in their home home environment? The second one is around, as, a, uh, as, as mentioned, on combustion. So heating, cooling, what can be done around new technologies, transition through to that, as well as procurement of, of, of energy. Um, and then perhaps the third one is, is really, you know, the, the, the crude rule of thumb that your impact is where your spend is. And so, you know, addressing uh and influencing what's in your control uh, uh and what i mean by that is your suppliers so how can you try and uh, uh, uh shape and work with suppliers in terms of what you expect from them as part of their service delivery as well 
Super. Thank you very much. Um, the questions are coming in thick and fast um, while our time is running out. So I'm going to ask um, one question of all of you, and then there's an extra one for, for Jamie and Martin, given today's topic. So the one for all of you, I think, is, is uh, very relevant, given we've got this, this quite unique opportunity coming out of this pandemic. We really have a moment to rethink uh, how we want our society to work and to you know, we had that glimpse of a clean air future uh, last year when, you know, we all stopped driving around and the air pollution sort of dropped by 30%, halved in some parts of cities, but people noticed it was quieter, uh, you could hear the birds sing, you know, you could chat to your neighbour over the street, it felt so much safer to walk, cycle and play in the street. People really like those aspects. So. Someone's asked, sustainable development goal number 11 is focused on sustainable cities and communities. How much do we need to redesign our urban areas and ways of life to ensure clean air? And then the extra bonus question for, for Martin and Jamie, because I think it is very relevant. Uh, upon hearing about resolution uh, 4530, do you now feel more motivated to take action to address air pollution to protect children's health? So shall I go in the reverse order? So I'll start with you this time, Jamie, and go backwards. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Larissa. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, personally, um, uh, the motivation has always always been there in terms of um, um, my beliefs. But I guess in, in terms of uh, what I take, you know, the role that business can have around lobbying, continuing to lobby and influence, uh, you know, through through government and what we believe is, you know, a sensible path. And we are already engaged in a lot of those those areas. So I think that's the most proactive way uh, that we can be involved. Thank you, Martin. Cheers. Yeah, I have to be the first one to not do the mute right at the end. Uh, so, um, well, yes, in in sure, uh, very much uh, more uh, motivated in that regard. We're we're very, uh, you know, we have a lot of structures in in a very big um, company as we are, but linking in with the SDG point uh, as well. That um, SDG eleven is, as you may have remember from the slide, is one of our core. Um, uh, focus areas for us uh, uh, so that we can bring that 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 full sweep of, of things um, to bear on that you know um, whether it be a heat pump or autonomous driving or um, you know the control and security camera systems whatever the whole the whole thing as to what that means to be a, a truly sustainable city as the world is um, urbanizing but I shall certainly uh, be taking my own um, personal drive and driving this back up the levels as to um, how we respond, have been responding um, in that regard. So yes, in short, and then the longer answer I get. That's great. Uh, thank you very much. Um, John? I guess as a human rights person, I have to balance the, 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 sort of the good and the bad in a way. I mean, I think we do have this great opportunity of, of eradicating um, dirty air from our cities that we haven't had for 2,000 years, right? Um, so I'm a big believer in green technology and, and, and the role it will play. What I'm not a believer in is sort of green utopian thinking. Um, and you'll see in some parts of the world with smart cities, etc., and almost ignoring, you know, ignore, over, overlooking things like freedom of expression, right to assembly, um, human, human autonomy um, in, the, in the role of surveillance technologies um, that, that, that are sometimes legitimized to keep our cities clean um, can also control human populations. So I think as we move forward to clean up our cities and have smarter cities, we all have, also have to be very smart about what it means to be human and the freedoms that we, we hold dear and for our children and for us. So just balancing that out, the, uh, the human rights and the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Maria Pia. Thank you. Um, I think you know, it needs to be more um, coordination about departments and then talking to each other, breaking down silos. And if actually, if there are decisions being taken, these decisions need to be informed. So if, you, um, if departments are making planning decisions, they should consider uh, children's health uh, when they do those decisions. And also, yeah, local action that is supported by the government is also um, important and needs to take into account that indeed there are some areas that are worse affected um, than others. 
Lovely. Thank you. And David, the final word to you before I wrap up. Thanks, Larissa. Uh, yes, I think that in terms of SDG 11, it's really important to redesign cities for people. You know, we've spent the last century designing cities for cars, um, and it's really quite shocking. I mean, I did a lot of work with the city of Vancouver here in Canada on their green transition. And when we started out, we had, you know, the engineers do calculations. 33% of Vancouver is parking lots, roads, and other areas dedicated to cars. 15% is green space for people to enjoy. I mean, those numbers should be reversed. So we clearly have our work cut out. We need to, we need to redesign cities so that people can get to school, get to work, get to parks by walking, by cycling, by hopping on a public transit. And, and so that's a, that's a big task, but um, the most livable cities in the world are the greenest cities in the world. So the, the writing's on the wall, I think. Yeah, makes you wonder how we ever got to this situation, eh? Who would design a city around a vehicle rather than a person? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, let's, let's, let's use the insight we've uh, now arrived at somewhat too late. Super. Well, thank you so much to all my speakers, uh, our speakers, um, and for sharing all your knowledge with us today. There have been many more questions that we haven't got to, so do feel free while I'm wrapping up to... Um, answer those questions directly. Some are more specific on trees and things. Um, so do have a look in the Q&A box and answer them while I'm wrapping up. Because um, really, well, what a discussion this has been. And indeed, what a clean air day this has been. For me, it started um, rather early with a BBC radio interview. And I was then delighted to discover that the story about three million children or one in four um, school children in the UK breathing polluted air had hit the papers, the front pages, um, most media channels, uh, and by 9 a.m. hashtag Clean Air Day uh, was actually trending at number one on Twitter. So we really are reaching new audiences with this information, which is just so crucial. Um, so needless to say, I was feeling quite buoyant at our first event, which was an all party parliamentary group meeting on air pollution, where we discussed the same topic as we are here, uh, the urgent need for action on air pollution to protect children's health, but in this case, the role of policymakers. And that political theme then continued at the um, following Westminster Commission event. And I'm really pleased that um, MPs have been increasingly active throughout the day, um, showing their support um, on social media. Again, it was the hashtag Clean Air, Air Day has been the most used hashtag by MPs today. Um, Clean Air Day was discussed in the House of Commons this morning by the Secretary of State and government today issued their response to the Future Prevention of Deaths report um, in the case of Ellicacy Deborah, uh, committing to more action on raising public awareness. So I need to look in, into it in depth. It came in late this afternoon, but um, that's promising. Uh, meanwhile, in Wales, the Deputy Minister for Climate Change committed to introduce um, a Clean Air Act based on World Health Organization guidelines and the new Environment Minister in Scotland trailed their new clean air strategy. strategy. So yeah, it's been a super busy day. Um, we've seen councils doing stuff, Westminster Council announced plans to pedestrianise parts of Oxford Street and Regent Street. Schools have been doing so much artwork, um, putting it on, doing videos on social media. In Glasgow, they've been beaming up um, their artwork on buildings. NHS organisations have been running events to train staff on air pollution to be able to advise patients, including a visit from the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, to the Royal London Hospital, where they've been doing just that. Um, but I'm pleased to say that soon this shouldn't be the sole responsibility of champions in these hospitals, as the Royal College of Physicians has pledged to review the curriculum and to look systematically at how to increase clinicians' understanding about air pollution, which is great. Um, and of course, there's all the wonderful individual champions such as Sue and her signs, who's been standing at a railway crossing all day asking people to turn off their engine. There's been lovely clean air displays in libraries in Windsor and Maidenhead. And of course, business action. I've actually never seen so much business action um, on clean air day. There does seem to be a lot of willing and activity on the staff pledges side of things and getting people to and from work in a clean way. Uh, which is super, a great start. But what we now need, of course, is for um, companies to address pollutants coming from core business. So this is your call to action. Um, don't uh, wait for the legislation to arrive, for it will. But, you know, take the early mover advantage and respond to your corporate responsibility to act on air pollution. We know the public want action. 94% of people in the UK, in fact, think it should be a priority for the UK and want business and governments to act more urgently. 
So now is the time. As you've heard today, you as businesses have a direct responsibility, as governments have a duty to act on children's right to have a clean and healthy environment. And this means clean air. So this is your Clean Air Day 2021 challenge. Today, tomorrow, um, can you publicly declare a corporate commitment to take action on air pollution? And then between now and Clean Air Day in June 2020, could you develop a company plan to reduce operational impact on air pollution, take action on any identified adverse impact on air quality, and then start to report annually, say every Clean Air Day, on your progress. These are actually some of the um, principles of our Business for Clean Air initiative. So if you are going to do those things, then do sign up um, and get the credit for it. We do need to see business leaders now stepping up because um, this really is what needs to happen. This is what children need you as business leaders to do to protect their health. Because once you know how bad air pollution is for children's health, which we've heard today, um, you really can't unknow it all you can do from this point on is act. And as Stephen Holgate, the UK clean air champion here in the UK and also a very eminent professor in um, respiratory health put it, future generations are dependent on us. So um, just want to say thank you very much to our speakers once again, um, to David Boyd, Maria Pia Bianchetti, Jamie Quinn, Martin Fahi, John Morrison. It's been a super, uh, evening's discussion. Thank you for joining us at seven in the morning as well, uh, David. And um, have a look at our new um, white paper, Air Pollution, uh, the new business challenge. Um, sign up to Business for Clean Air. And I look forward to hearing your progress on tackling air pollution this time next year. Thank you all very much for coming and have a lovely evening. Thanks Thank you, much, everyone. Larissa. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well Thank you. done.